I'm Nate Lind, and I help people interested in buying or selling online businesses get the transaction done without the deal falling apart. If you're looking to buy or sell online businesses, then be sure to keep tuning in for more videos like this one. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications about new videos and interviews. And introduce yourself in the comments. Are you a buyer or a seller? Enjoy the interview. Rochelle, thank you for joining us today. Let's talk a little bit about the legal process in M&A in general. And, and then the follow-up question, what does it typically cost? Okay. So, um, you know, this is a question that I answer probably three or four times a day uh, in phone calls, as you might imagine. So let's talk a little bit about the process. You know, when I talk to clients, what we always talk about, and whether you're a buyer or a seller, you might have a different point of view as how these are addressed, but we always talk about what I call the five elements of a transaction. And the five key elements are framing, and, and I'll just say, this is what people say to me. They say, why do I need a lawyer? And for what, you know, what exactly are you going to do for me in this deal? I'm already working with a great broker. I'm already, you know, I already know everything about my business. So here's what it really comes down to. There's five areas. Number one, how are we going to frame the purchase price and what's being acquired? Is it an asset deal? Is it a stock or a membership interest deal? How are you going to be paid? Is there a SBA loan? Is it a cash deal? Is there a seller note? Is there a holdback? Is there an escrow? And how are you as a seller going to collect that money? And how are you as a buyer going to be obligated to pay that money? And and what triggers those payments? First area. What ex and part of the first area is, and what do you get for that money? You know, what is it you're selling? Sometimes you have multiple businesses in one company. Sometimes you have multiple businesses made up in a variety of companies. But you have to question what exactly it is you're buying. So that's area one. The second part of every deal is what representations and warranties are being made. A seller is going to represent and warrant the condition of the business. They're going to warrant and represent that the assets are owned, that they have good title, that they have authority to sell them, that the financials that have been provided are true and correct, that there are no um, infringements and the intellectual property is owned, that they're in compliance with law, that they have paid their taxes. But all of those representations, of course, have some caveats or disclosures that are attached to that. So there may be exceptions. Something may not be 100% true. Perhaps they have not been collecting sales tax and paying sales tax in every state. Or perhaps they have, um, have had some sort of warning letter or one of those letters from a plaintiff's lawyer in California saying that they have violated a California um, advertising law or some other unique aspect. And you have to figure out how are you going to disclose that if you're the seller and if you're the buyer, how are you going to deal with the fact that there were these issues and what are we going to do about it? How are you going to protect yourself from the prior actions before closing? So that is all about representations and warranties and disclosure statements. The third piece of that ties right in. It's indemnification. So the short answer is how are you going to protect yourself as a buyer, you're going to seek indemnification from the seller. Indemnification means how am I going to get money in the event the seller did something prior to closing or represented something that is not true? Or maybe it was true, but it turns out to not be exactly correct. Maybe there was just a um, missing element, or maybe it was disclosed and you knew all about it, but now someone's coming after you for it. And... Um, and you have to think a little bit about how does that indemnification work? And if you're a seller, you're going to want to know for how many years am I representing things and warranting things? So can the buyer come back to me for like the rest of my life? Or is the buyer only going to come back to me for a year or two years? And maybe it'll be different depending on whether or not it's a fundamental representation, something like good title to the assets you're selling or it's a you know lesser or more standard representation you know such as the um you know there are no um agreements and it turns out you had a copier agreement and you didn't tell them about it or something like that and um and then so there's survival and then there's the cap 
how much money can the buyer come back after? In today's market, it's generally been between 15 and 30%. Heavily negotiated, varies by the business. Um, sometimes fundamental reps like good title might not have a cap or might be capped at the purchase price or maybe a 50%. While normal reps and warranties, and we call them reps and warranties, representations and warranties, those normal things are going to be capped at around 15 to 30%, somewhere in that range has been very typical. Okay. The next piece is transition. You're buying an online business, it's not exactly like you just bought a car and here are the keys and the transition is get in the car and you're off. Transition in these businesses requires how will the information and the knowledge of running the company transition to the buyer. I am a huge fan for both the buyer and seller of a minimum of 90 days. Here's my view. The first 30 days, the buyer learns the business watching the seller run it. The next 30 days, the buyer runs the business with the seller watching the buyer run it. The last 30 days, telephonic, as you need it, connecting, making sure it's transitioning. Why do I like 90 days? And I tell every buyer and every seller, it protects you both. It enables you to go through a life cycle of the business. It goes through a season. It causes you to maybe have to order new product, causes you to have to pay. It means you have to close the books. It, it gives you a full view of what's happened in a period. We're 30 days or a week. Hey, honestly, not everything that you do in your business happens in the normal week or in the normal 30-day period, but usually over 90 days it does. That's my recommendation. One thing I will go back to on transition services, here's why it protects the buyer and the seller. The buyer will be most successful if they fully take over the business and they understand how to operate it. The seller will have its best night at, uh, and be able to sleep when they know the buyer is successful in operating the business. It's important. People overlook it, but it's important. That's a good point. I mean, sellers don't want to look over their shoulder all the time wondering, you know, shoot, did they just yeah. sign up for a lawsuit? Exactly. And, and I, I, you know, well, we can talk, you know, in a minute, I'll answer your other question about price, but uh, we should talk a little bit about buyers who don't fully take over businesses and, and why it's problematic. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let, let's do a little, like share a story about all this. So let's tie all this process together and give me, give us an example or a war story of a client that, that went through this and, and uh, hopefully it's a success story, but we learned just as much from failure. So we'll take either. So I'm going to give you at least three failures and they are the only failures I've ever had where we get to a point where we're talking about potential lawsuits, which is really interesting. But what's happened, and, and, and this is not a single story because there's three of them, over probably 10 years of doing these kinds of deals, three. That's not really a lot. Oh, but, that's awesome. But Congratulations. But, but, but these are crazy stories when you hear yeah. them. These are situations, and they were almost all identical, and in each case, a different kind of buyer. Uh, but these were buyers who bought a business they didn't really understand. And what happened is, in one case, it was a private equity firm. In another case, it was a um, strategic buyer who thought they knew all about Amazon because they were on Vendor Central. And they hit, were distributing through Vendor Central, which we know is very different than Seller Central. And, um, and then I had another one who it was an individual, and it really wasn't that much of an Amazon business. It, was, um, it had both Amazon as well as other platforms. But in each case, the buyer failed to take charge of the business. So I'll give you some examples. In one case, they went in and got some training and spent lots of time with the seller on training, but kept asking the seller to continue to run the business. When it got to be about 90 days into it, the seller had felt that this transition services agreement was over and that the buyer should be taking over. And they sent the buyer a note and said, hey, look, you still got everything coming to our warehouse. You haven't changed your address. You haven't taken over the phones. You haven't done any of those things. What are you going to do? How are you going to take over? And in that case, the buyer came, came back and said, no, no, no. I, I want you to just keep running the business for me. Needless to say, my seller went crazy. He said, well, wait a minute. You owe me a bunch of money, but I didn't sell the business so that I could run it for you and you would get the upside. 
that's not the deal. If I'm going to run it and I'm going to make all the decisions, I want the upside. What This is crazy. So they are in a serious dispute. The second time I saw something like this happen, the buyer was a private equity firm and they, they were convinced that this is easy stuff. Let's face it. If a, an entrepreneur can do this out of a bedroom, then a private equity firm with a series of Ivy League MBAs can certainly run this business. Well, what people fail to understand is this is 24 seven, 52 weeks a year, even Christmas day. I mean, you, you, you've got to be on this business and you have to have a plan for it. You don't and, get to clock out at 5 p.m. and drive home and, and spend yeah. time coaching basketball and, and football. Well, the funny part about it is you might be able to do that, but you have to have a plan when you are clocked out for what you're going to do to get clocked back in when you're done with that coaching experience. Yeah. It's just like my practice. I mean, I get clients all the time that say to me, why are you answering at night? I'm like, you're working at night. Well, what am I going to do? I mean, I can't, in the event of an emergency, we got to respond. And, um, and it's just, it was a scenario where they never understood how the business worked. They, um, and this happened with the second client as well. And it was the strategic buyer using Vendor Central. Again, didn't really understand how the business works. So they had a great nine to five staff. Five o'clock comes, their staff goes home. These people don't act like owners of the business. They're not entrepreneurial. They're not creative. They're looking for a handbook that's going to tell them what to do when a customer wants to return product. They're, they're waiting for what to do. Where's the handbook when Amazon gives you a seller performance notice and you need an improvement plan? And, um, and they're looking for how do you do that? Well, as we know, every improvement plan is different because every seller performance notice is vague, arbitrary, and not exactly clear about what went wrong. <laughs> so you're trying, you know, you're trying again to thread a needle, but you have no idea where the needle is. So it's kind of crazy. But those are the kinds of stories that we see where they're coming after indemnification. Most of these deals, we don't see that. And I just emphasize over and over again, just make sure you do great transition services. Make sure the buyer knows they got to take over the company and are prepared and if you're a seller, don't sell to a buyer who isn't prepared to do that. And if you are a buyer, don't buy if you're not prepared to work. Don't have If you have a different job during the day, don't buy this company. You won't be ready to take it over. And the last piece is the non-compete. If you are buying a business, you're going to want the seller to commit to not compete with you. But if the seller has other businesses, they may be able to agree not to compete with you directly, but they may have to carve out for their other businesses. No seller who works in the online world is gonna agree I'll never work online again. They're never gonna agree I'll never sell in Amazon again. So you have to navigate, and it's a little bit like threading a needle. You've gotta get the precise ideas out there that need to be protected, while at the same time, give the seller the ability to live their lives and, and potentially continue to work. You know, frankly, even though these deals sometimes are big dollar deals, and I've done some deals that are, you know, 40, 50, 60 million dollar deals, I've also done far more that are much smaller. And most people selling their business based on age and based on um, and sale price, this isn't their last gig. So they can't agree to never work again. And as a buyer, you can't agree to have them compete. And so again, an area that as lawyers we navigate very closely. Gotcha. Very, very interesting. Okay. That's, uh, that's fascinating. I, I wouldn't have imagined that of your years of experience, the, the sticky, the hair has been around the transition. Um, that's, that's really interesting, but I guess Not that makes sense. The transition of moving the account though. I mean, I, I know how to Amazon accounts, Walmart accounts. We, we see those accounts move. We have no problem with that. Mm. It's the actual people that are the problem. Of course, of course. Uh, okay, so let's go back to uh, one of our original questions and talk a little bit about what what does the what is it? What's the typical cost? What what should a, a seller and a buyer expect uh, to budget for engaging someone of your services or or someone th to help them thread through the uh, the legal process of this? Yeah. So you know, legal services. Sometimes people say, "Me, can you do it on a flat fee?" And the answer is, sometimes I can. The problem with the flat fee on mergers and acquisitions is that if the deal doesn't close, the flat fee is still due. You're still obligated to the full amount. So you could be weeks into the deal 
and then determine it's not going to close, but you've already committed to a flat fee and that fee is due at the beginning of our process. So most of the time, our clients are working on an hourly rate. What we try to do is be very transparent. And when you look at costs, there are things that you can do as a buyer or seller that will help you contain your cost. You know, typically, I think that, you know, the cost is generally going to be in the area of 1% of the deal price. And when I say in the area of 1%, if you are selling to a private equity firm and you're taking back stock or some membership interest and we're going to negotiate a deal with that private equity firm for your future payments, you're talking about a much bigger price, but you're probably also talking about a much bigger purchase price. So, you know, I, in general, when we see these deals in the up to a million, million and a half range, the cost is going to be somewhere in the $7,500 to $12,000 range. If you add a private equity firm and we're doing a valuation of a five, 10, 20, $50 million deal, it really is going to depend on how complex the deal is, but you're probably looking at a per, uh, you know, legal fees of forty to $80,000. And that's because we're negotiating sophisticated financing, complex transactions, where you're going to become an owner of a future share of something in a private equity firm. It's a more complex deal. If we are dealing with, you know, a $5 million deal and it's an SBA loan with a purchaser paying cash for the difference, frankly, you're not going to really be at 1%. You're still going to be in that $7,500 or $12,000 range because the, the purchase price itself isn't what drives that work. So how do you get to the bottom of the range instead of the top of the range? That's the question we get. It all depends on how prepared you are. If you are a seller and you have your ducks in a row and you have your paperwork in a row and when we sit down and say, let's have that meeting and go over reps and warranties and you've been able to pull together good information of your material contracts, good information of any lawsuits you may have had, all of your trademarks, all of your disclosures, if you really know your business and you organize all of it and you spend your time reading the agreement and going through and making sure you have all your financials in place and you have a buyer on the other side who understands what they're buying, you're going to be at the lower end of the range. If you, however, have a mess for documents or you have a buyer with an attorney who doesn't know what they're doing, and we're going to talk about that, um, or you are a seller who, doesn't, who has an attorney who doesn't know what they're doing, it could drive the price up. And here's why. I never have a problem with the biggest firms in the country on the other side, because those are experienced mergers and acquisitions attorneys. When I have an attorney on the other side of a deal who on Monday does DUI cases and on Tuesday writes wills and on Thursday does personal injury and on Friday, he's going to do mergers and acquisitions. Needless to say, that person doesn't know what they're doing. We give them a document or they give us a document and it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't meet your needs. It doesn't cover the intellectual property that you have. It doesn't meet the standards of normal mergers and acquisitions. And now we start negotiating what's the normal range for indemnification? What are the normal representations and warranties? What are the normal disclosures? And we start to negotiating with someone who doesn't understand who doesn't have the experience. They don't know what normal is. They're not giving any guidance to their client. That is a messy deal that costs a lot more money. Another messy deal is a, is a person, and I've had this happen. I'll tell you a great story. I had a client, my client, you gotta love them, good, per, good people, but they are, they, they are the um, analysis paralysis of the world. Indecisive, Every word of every document was renegotiated three or four times before we sent it to the other side. They couldn't decide themselves if the language was okay. Husband and wife, they would, we'd be on the phone with them for hours while they argued with each other 
over what the right answer was, whether or not the language was right, whether or not their documents. Remember, as lawyers, we may have just been hired. But we don't know your business like you know your business. We need you to know your business. But if you're going to be arguing between yourselves or if you're going to be, you know, second guessing every single thing drives the price up like crazy. Uh, what are some other factors that change the legal cost of buying and selling a business? Anything that you haven't touched on? Well, sometimes you have a business that has some ugly stuff. You know, we've taken over a business um, deal where there were infringing trademarks or where there are ongoing litigation matters, such as um, claims from these California plaintiffs, lawyers, FDA claims, regulatory matters. In one case, this was kind of an ugly situation. We had a seller who had a prior bad history with Amazon and was barred as a seller, but he had a relationship with another person who who actually owned the seller account, but this guy really owned the business. And we had to navigate how do you how do you get confidence and how do you transfer that business when the person who owns the account isn't the person who's selling you the business. Another thing that makes it a little complicated at times is if you have a scenario where you're dealing with European as well as US as well as Australian assets. You know, the UK companies transfer differently and UK accounts transfer differently. European accounts transfer differently. Sometimes that gets a little messy and takes us a little extra work. Um, we do have co-counsel in the UK that we regularly use when we need that help um, on the European issues. And we have somebody that we can use in Australia if we do need that help. Um, but it does add to the price because now you've got two sets of lawyers. Uh, Rochelle, do you have any like checklists or templates or blueprints or anything that, uh, that you make available to your clients that you'd be willing to share with the, uh, the, the viewers of, uh, of this? Um, you know, we, I don't have um, checklists. What I do have are some like due diligence lists. And yeah. I can certainly send you a, a good due diligence list for an e-commerce business. And that actually helps because we do send it out. And if, if you're a seller, it's a good way to organize your materials. And if you're a buyer, it's what you want to look for. And um, I think that's probably a good a good starting point. Of Would love it. Well, we've had a number of fantastic topics today. That's going to be a, a huge value to uh, to our audience. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe and tell me what you thought about it in the comments. Your comments encourage me to continue posting videos, and they give me ideas about what to post next. I read and reply to every single one. Also, if you own an online business and you're curious of how much it's worth, click the link below to get a free business valuation with a member of our team. Who knows? It may even be me you're talking to.